So you want to become a backend engineer, but you're probably wasting time chasing all of the wrong information. You're learning this framework, but the job market is telling you to do this. You're using this database when the job market is telling you not to. Simply put, you're learning the wrong stuff to become a backend engineer, and I'm here to change that. If you're new to the channel, I'm Eric Roby, a software engineer with over a decade of experience and author of several coding courses that has more than 100,000 active students worldwide. Let's start by explaining what backend engineering even is. Well, backend engineering focuses on the behind the scenes aspects of software development. So behind the scenes, backend engineering. It helps with the building and maintaining of the server side components that powers applications. In pretty simple terms, there's really three main aspects. There's the APIs and the endpoints that backends usually have to work with, managing databases, and handling the security for the application. Now, there are a few other items that the backend engineer is usually required for, but these are the main three. Now to get into backend engineering, there's probably like a hundred different programming languages that you can choose from. I always, always, always recommend either Python or Java. Most of my content is Python related, so I'm going to kind of push that direction a little bit more. Python is easier to read, it's easier to type, and you can do a lot more with a lot less code compared to something like Java. But the benefit Java has is you have to type out so much more, which makes you have to really, really understand what you're typing. So if you're doing like data structures and algorithms, you literally have to type out all the data structures while Python kind of does it behind scenes. You don't have to really know what you're doing because it handles a whole lot of the magic behind scenes. So I would still probably lean toward Python as it will allow you to get off the ground quicker in being able to develop applications and be able to do scripts and things that you might want to do right now, which is why you want to become a backend engineer. Now to learn Python, there's really Really two ways you can do this. You can either read books or you can watch videos. And since you're on YouTube, you're probably a video person. So if you're trying to learn Python, you can learn Python free on YouTube. There's programming with Mosh. There's a whole bunch of other YouTubers out there that teach the basics of Python. I also have a one hour video right here. It's going to be up in one of these corners that allows you to also just get started with Python, install Python, get started, learn a lot of the basics. But once you want to get a little bit further, you might want to check out Udemy or check out a really long tutorial here on YouTube that'll really help you learn all of the, the basics and the fundamentals. I would say like it has to be 10 hours to really like cover all the fundamentals of Python. And you want to make sure that you're typing along and really trying to learn as you watch the video, because these fundamentals are going to stick with you the entire time. Yeah, we're going to be using libraries and frameworks, but the basics of Python is what integrates all of that into the ecosystem. Now that was for video tutorials. If you're more of a book person, you can Google top Python books and kind of keep a list of the books that keep showing up. Those are usually probably going to be like the top books. So go ahead, Google, you know, how to become a Python developer through books. And I'm sure there's going to be a whole bunch of different links like Reddit and some other things that tell you exactly what books you might want to be looking into if, if you want to become a Python developer. Now, once you get the basics Python, you're going to want to go to a framework. Now, Django is a very big framework for Python, it allows you to be able to do so much stuff. So I'm going to say you should probably go to fast API. Fast API is going to be a more traditional slash modern approach for specifically backend engineering. It allows you to be able to consume API endpoints and allows you to, be able to return data back to the user. So when we're talking about API endpoints, what even is an API? An API is an application programming interface. And when we're talking about web applications or web APIs, most of the time we're going to be talking talking about RESTful APIs. Now, this means simply that you are consuming data from some application and you're returning data back to that application. Now, the best way to really explain like what a RESTful endpoint really is, or really an API in general, but we're talking about RESTful for the sake of this video. Think of like if you're at a restaurant, there's the chefs in the back that are making food. You can think of that as like the database or the backend language. Then there's the people ordering the food, which are the people, which is the client, you can think of like a front end application, it's the client that is asking for some kind of data or some kind of food item. And then there's the waiter or waitress. And we can kind of think of the waiter or waitress as the API endpoint. So when you go to a restaurant, people are being like, Hey, I would like spaghetti, you tell the waitress, Hey, I would like spaghetti, the waitress then proceeds to tell the chef, Hey, we have an order of spaghetti, they hand the waitress the spaghetti, and we 
we give it back to the person ordering it. That's essentially how APIs work. It's a way to connect different applications, or it's a way to connect your front end to your back end. Now, a framework like Fast API allows you to be able to do this easily. And it's kind of follows the same motto, don't reinvent the wheel. It allows you to be able to do things really quickly. So if you already know how to use Python and you implement a framework like Fast API, it comes with all the tools and resources to be able to create these RESTful endpoints very fast for your client or for your application. Now, once you know that from the framework like Fast API, you need a way to be able to store data. So if the client says, hey, I want this information about this specific user, the RESTful endpoint will tell Fast API that, hey, we need to get this data, but we need a way to store this data, right? So there's really two schools of thought. There's a SQL database and there's a NoSQL database. Now, for the sake of this video, SQL is significantly more popular than NoSQL when it comes to just job opportunities and applications. So I would say stick with SQL if you're following a backend roadmap for right now. And the three top SQL databases for a Python fast API application for a backend engineer would be SQLite, MySQL, and PostgreSQL. Now for big production applications, you're going to see Postgres and MySQL kind of dominating that world. For smaller companies or even side projects, you're going to see SQLite kind of dominating that world. And that's because SQLite is super small, super fast, has one purpose, and that's really to support small to mid-sized companies, while Postgres and MySQL can scale significantly better to consume and help with a millions of records and data inside. Now, the next bump is going to be security. Now, when you think of security as a back engineer, there are a couple different schools of thought. There's security like SQL injection and then making sure you don't have supply chain vulnerabilities. But one of the biggest ones is going to be authentication and authorization. So authentication is making sure that you are who you say you are. So if you like go on like a college campus and you have like a badge to like scan to get in a door, you can get in because the badge is you. You are authenticated, right? When it beeps and says, yeah, you are authenticated. So that's the same thing with like a username and password. Are you typing in the right username and password to say who you say you are? The next step is authorization. So when it beeps, when you go back to the college example, when it beeps, is a door going to unlock or is a door going to stay locked? Now, I'm sure in college campuses, when you have a badge, your badge allows you to only be able to get into certain rooms, but it doesn't let you get into all rooms and you are only authorized to get into specific rooms. So that's kind of how authorization works in software as well. So authentication is username and password. And then authorization is, do you have the rights to get the data that you're requesting? So if you are a user and you're like, hey, and you're communicating to the RESTful endpoint to your fast API application, you're saying, hey, I'm Eric, here's my password. I want to retrieve this data. Your password and username might be correct. I mean, that does mean you're authenticated, but there's also going to be an authorization factor afterwards to say, is this user allowed to get this data? Now, the way that it typically happens in modern development, this authentication and authorization combo is something called JWT, JSON Web Tokens. These are becoming increasingly popular within web development and kind of applications in general. A JWT will have an authenticated user with an authorization kind of roles and responsibilities usually attached inside. So if you're wanting to learn more about authentication and authorization, go ahead and check out JWTs. And I have a video right here somewhere that is going to be a fast API example creating these JWTs. And now one of the last parts of a back end engineer is going to be design, but specifically for the back end part. And there's really three main responsibilities. There's going to be a scalable solution, making sure you have a reliable solution and making sure that your solution is maintainable. So scale means if your application grows, is your application as your client body grows, is your application created in such a way that it will also scale and grow to be able to sustain the new amount of users. Reliability is saying, does your application crash? Will it go down? And one of the best ways to kind of handle reliability in that aspect is through like cloud computing because AWS and all these other cloud computers like GCP and Azure allow for like 99.999999 uptime. So if you're deployed on AWS and you're using like their high availability and you're using all these new, you know, cloud platforms that they have already created for you, your application has a really good chance of being reliable. So the only way it will really crash is if it's not scaling or if you created your own bugs inside the application itself. And the last is maintainability. And maintainability means are you 
adding in debuggers where you need to add debuggers? Are you unit testing your application to make sure that, hey, if another user comes in and changes stuff or another developer, the application doesn't just crash? And are you following clean code? And there's a book called Clean Code by Uncle Bob who kind of goes over a lot of awesome, awesome information. The book is written in Java, but it has the same principles no matter what programming language you are in. So, and that is the backend engineering roadmap for this year to really help propel you. Now, if you're interested in Python and Fast API, here's a video that you can watch now to get started, and I'll see you in the next.